Tasse Bhagavato Rahato Sambha Sambhudasa Namo Tasse Bhagavato Rahato Sambha Sambhudasa Namo Tasse Bhagavato Rahato Sambha Sambhudasa Udang Damang Sangang Namasami So the fourth Brahma Vihara, the fourth boundless abode, divine abiding after metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, mudita, gladness, is upeka or equanimity or equipoise. And in Buddhist thought, most lists have, and the Buddha had many lists, have one representative of wisdom. And in the four Brahma Viharas, the four, these loving states, these manifestations of metta or loving kindness, upeka or equanimity is the representative, uh, the embodiment of the quality of wisdom. And it gets short shrift a lot of the time because it's a bit harder to speak about. Yet it's also characterized some of the more important moments in my life. Because where each of the other Brahma Viharas, those three faces of Brahma, honor, and look towards states of other beings, their current moment of happiness, of suffering. Equipoise or equanimity honors truth. It looks at the whole of experience, of another being's path, their failings, their failures of our own limits on our own action. And also to what lies beyond the truth of the whole situation. When I was finishing high school, I took a gap year and uh, I worked in a warehouse for half that gap year and um, sort of did things that young 19 year olds would do and sort of bottled up at home in my hometown. And then I went to India and spent a significant period traveling. And I stayed about a month in Calcutta in, at the Mother Teresa Center. And my trajectory at that point was very much towards um, explicit social action, which is a deeply noble path in life. And what happened was I met a doctor there uh, named Sabrina from Germany who had started a clinic in the slums and ran it by herself. And um, I was very moved and uh, spent many days following her until I saw her one day her completely break down. She was so exhausted from the weight of what she was doing and the constant giving and the constant encounter with suffering without taking care of her own heart that there was no resources left. And I saw her just begin screaming at the people that she was working with. And it was this moment of understanding the limits of even this unbelievably noble path, if it wasn't accompanied by attention to the heart and by a skill in cultivating the heart and by inner resources and an ability to step back. 
and look towards a higher narrative that can hold within it all these actions in the world and should, but that also is not dependent upon them. And that, I think, was one of the fundamental moments that changed my trajectory into robes. And not that, uh, you know, I, I don't, I think social action is unbelievably important. But one aspect of equanimity, equipoise, is understanding our own capacities and also of the capacity of the world to meet our expectations or to not. So in a simple sense, equanimity is the ability to see when others cannot receive our explicit help for whatever reason and to be able to step back and let them have their freedom, which is a manifestation of love in and of itself, actually. And this is essential because sometimes people don't want our help. Um, and sometimes they're not uh, inclined to accept it or to change at this moment in the way we personally think they should. And to be able to step back a bit and acknowledge their freedom is essential and, and a deep aspect of love. In some ways, it's one of the more profound ones and difficult ones. It's the love of a parent who allows their child while learning to walk, to stumble and fall again and again until they learn to stand. And in a sense, we have to have the willingness to step back a little and let others have their freedom, their choice, and acknowledge that we don't always know what's best, or certainly we don't always have the ability to convey that in ways we think we should, and to allow that. Ajahn Amaro was once asked what the difference between equanimity and indifference was. And he said that equanimity doesn't have the m quality. There's no m in it, which I think is quite a good measure. Too much m, it's not equanimity. And I think this is good to see that equanimity and all these faces of Brahma, all these Brahma Viharas have a quality of sweetness in them. Even this one which ostensibly involves a stepping back slightly. So as the parent watches their child stumble, it's not that they don't want to help, or as we watch those in our lives make mistakes, it's not that we don't care, but we all also acknowledge that we don't always have the right, and it's not always best for us to step in. And in that sense, it's not only an acknowledgement of another's freedom, but of mystery because people's paths are strange and beautiful and mysterious in ways we do not understand. And we don't always know what's best. And this can manifest in a very clear way. Um, with those closest to us, uh, ironically, and I'm sure coming out of the Christmas season, people are quite familiar with the uh, turbulent dynamics of family dinner tables, especially extended family and how the terrible irony of the fact that those we love the most, somehow the self and the sankaras and the programs and the dynamics that get layered over that love and that relationship can dominate the relationship and the conversation and the meeting such that we barely get to touch the love and the vulnerability underneath it. So with those closest to me, with my family members, 
I find that traditional movements of metta saying, you know, the traditional phrases don't work as well. What does what work well actually is a stepping back and thinking of them not as my mother, my father, my sister, my uncle, uh, my best friend, my good friend, whatever, but as a friend in suffering, a friend in the spiritual path, um, a Kali and Amita, a beautiful friend who has their own path that's different than mine. And somehow that slight stepping back allows a little space between me and them for that wind of metta to enter. And ironically, that's how I can access with those closest to me, that sweetness. It's equanimity. And yet that is the path to the Brahma Viharas in those contexts sometimes is actually a stepping back. And to do this is not easy. When I came back to the US, I often speak about how I came back on election night and that was fun. And I found so many people changed the headlines and the constant influx of news had darkened people's hearts to an extent I did not realize. As they watched, you know, ostensibly, and as the headlines would have it, the world they loved begin to be cracked. And before I went back, I gave a foot massage to Longcore Sumedho, one of the senior teachers in our tradition, and he was talking about the trajectory of things in the world. And he said, yes, they go up and then they go down. They are Sankara. <laughs> in the classic laugh that Long Force Tomato has, if any of you have seen it. And it was with great love. And the only way that one is able to have that view at times of being able to step back at times is if one has another refuge to step back into. To expect ourselves to have equanimity or equipoise about the world around us and the shifting conditions when that's all we have is asking too much. So this is why we value this path and how it points to a narrative larger than the shifting and imperfect world we live in. Because if this world is not a place we go to seek refuge, but rather a chance to learn and to give, in the midst of imperfect, flawed, damaging, and damaged conditions and individuals and people we love. If it's not a thing we look to for refuge, if it's not a thing we feed on, but rather a place for us to shape ourselves into larger tools, better tools of compassion for the sake of something greater, of a goal of spiritual perfection in the heart, then we can have a degree of equanimity about that changing conditioned world because it's not where we're looking for refuge anymore. Samsara, this world will be imperfect and it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make it better as we can. But there is a time to also say, it's like this. Samsara is samsara is samsara. And that that's okay if we are using it and honoring it as one tool on the spiritual path towards a perfection of heart. And this is the refuge of the triple gem. This is the importance of establishing this other refuge that we can step back into.
of meditation every day where we anchor ourselves, of setting up a shrine in one, one's house so one can remember that other refuge, that other goal. This Buddha image is not representing some just some man 2,500 years ago, but the fact that there's something in the human heart that is immutable and immune to conditions. And I reference this often. I just watched the recent documentary about the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And in it, the Dalai Lama speaks again to his friend, the Tibetan Lama, who was in prison for 18 years, and said they barely avoided great danger. And when the Dalai Lama asked them what that danger was, he said the danger was that I would lose compassion for my captors. But he didn't. And something in the human heart when it's oriented correctly, can truly be immune to even those most brutal of conditions externally because it has a different Polaris and a different North Star, a different refuge. Similarly, we cultivate um, spiritual community like this, times of retreat. Because when we are held by people, when we are held by this path, then we can have a degree of stepping back, not just from the world, but also from those who surround us who aren't perfect. Because it's very easy for our other three Brahma Viharas of equanimity, of, uh, sorry, of uh, metta, of karuna, of sympathetic joy, to become entangled with much craving. You know, we might say that we just want the best for our loved one or our kid, and it's true, certainly. But when does that become threaded with the craving and the need to control them and the, the fallacy and the hubris that we know what is best for them always? and that it's our right to interfere with their path and their stumbling constantly. But if we, and if we realize that we are so often feeding off of and depending on those around us, then we realize the importance of cultivating other community, of an inner well-being that comes from meditation, of the power and beauty and well-being that comes from a path of purpose because that is something we feed on instead we turn to that for our refuge and then we no longer have to turn and rely on those around us for that same comfort we no longer have to try to control them and then with that slight stepping back we can let them have a degree of freedom. And that's real love. Then we can be more sure that whenever we do manifest metta, whenever we do move into someone's life and try to help them or try to alleviate their suffering, that it's not a movement tainted and muddied with our own craving, but rather truly an appropriate measured reaction that acknowledges their freedom. Bhante Analia translates equanimity, upeka, as equipoise. I really like that. Because in the Pali Suttas, equanimity has two meanings. It means it's a form of Vedana or feeling of neither pleasant nor painful feeling. But in this context, it's a different quality. It's, it's a sankhara. It's poise. And I think of the poise of a dancer. When you think of the moments in a dance where one stops in a moment of poise, it's a very particular moment. It's, there's no meh in it. It's deeply imbued with the dancer listening to the whole context, the audience, 
they're taking into account the movement that they've just had, their body's state, the next movement of the dance, but there's a moment of pause before the next movement. That's equipoise. It's aware, it's beautiful, it's graceful. And in a sense, this is what equanimity allows us is it's a stepping back, but a careful one where when we know that we can't exactly affect change at that moment, we allow ourselves to step back and keep a careful eye for when we can. Where is the crack in that veneer? Where we can move in. Where's the next motion of our dance? But it is a moment of pause and of rest. I found this to be a very potent recollection um, at a recent um, time with some very close relatives of mine where the conversation doesn't always turn towards monkish themes when you're with family. Although my family is uh, somewhat unique in this aspect, um, but still, uh, when with wider family, that's not always the case. And you don't really know how to talk about the latest shows um, and things. So it was very interesting to, you know, and, and to navigate those somewhat brutal dynamics of family life. And to be able to step back and just remain quiet for some of it, but then keep an eye out for those moments because there were cracks where I could just express deep love for this person. And just to, to, to be quiet enough for those other moments that when those cracks come, you're ready and you can move in right then. So when talks turns to politics, it's okay just to shut up. But then as soon as someone starts to talk about their spiritual life or something they care about or their kid or their job in a way that they have passion about, there you can touch that. But there's that place for equipoise. And this ability to to know the limitations of things, to see the wider picture, to see truth in that sense, not just in other people and their own failings and needs, you know, and allowing them that, but remembering to turn it to ourselves, to acknowledge our own limits and our own failings and to allow ourselves that. So frequently, a lot of equanimity towards others is just acknowledging that we don't have the resources always to move in and correct the world. We are more sick than we would like to admit. And you only realize that when you start to meet really healthy people, like uh, when you go to Thailand and you meet someone who's genuinely happy, like in a way you've never seen, or you see a video of Long Cha you kind of realize, you know, a lot of people say um, arahants, enlightened beings, are the only normal ones. The rest of us are kind of, you know, in the, in, we're not doing so well. And so this is important in terms of those friends we have that are suffering. I, there's people quite close to me recently who's, who know a couple in a deeply dark spot and have been pulled by this couple to give so much. And for this, these people close to me who are practitioners to be able to acknowledge their own limits, to be able to hold these other people in a degree of love and yet acknowledge that they can't fix the situation. And this is something that gets ignored in Buddhist practice often is you don't always have to deal with the trauma right away. You don't always have to forgive the person right away. We're not ready a lot of the time. So as I mentioned before, Ajahn Sona says, if you can't spread metta to someone, spread it to their chair. And I think he might add to that, well, he has. Um, if you can't spread it to their chair, you can write their name on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope and put it away for a while until you're ready to approach them again. 
There's a sutta called the Agata Vinaya Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, where the Buddha speaks about different means of removing resentment. Uh, he speaks of, there's actually multiple suttas with that name. And in this one, he says that one can spread loving kindness to them, spread compassion to them, spread equanimity to them. He leaves out sympathetic joy because I know, I think he realizes that's asking a lot towards those that we're having trouble with. And then he says, if those three don't work, you recall that they are the owners of their own actions and their own karma, which is the essential realization behind equanimity. And if that doesn't work, then you just don't bring them to mind. So it's okay. Ajahn Suchitta also re recommends uh, this saying that you don't go into trauma until you can stay out of trauma. You go in by choice. A stressor faced voluntarily is curative. A stressor faced involuntarily may not be. So with these people that our hearts just aren't ready to forgive, aren't ready to feel metaphor, just it's okay to have that limit. We are flawed ourselves. And it's okay just to not bring them to mind for a year if you need it. Some of these wounds are deep. And then later on, you can approach it again. And honestly, it really can help to write their name down on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope and put it away for a while. And just to make the determination that you are going to put it away until you're ready to bring it out again. And yet even this motion of writing their name down in an envelope or on a piece of paper, something that might seem cold on some level, it's based on the warmth and your care for yourself at some level too, because you're acknowledging yourself as flawed. So equanimity is the wider picture of our own limitations. It's the dancer stopping and taking stock of the whole piece, of the audience, of their body, of the breath, before they make their next motion. And for us, it's something we can only expect of ourselves. Like the dancer looking around that stage, you know, detaching them, because when they're in the middle of the dance, it's all about each motion. Their awareness is totally with the body, with the musical score. But in that moment of equipoise, of pause, of evaluation, of equipoise, of equanimity, they're taking stock of the wide situation. And this is where it's so important to understand the wider situation the Buddha and this Buddhist path gives us. A situation in which we are a flawed being, stumbling along with many other flawed beings in a flawed world that will remain flawed at some level. But that's okay. Because when our heart understands those shifting conditions as such, there's something that also is big enough in the heart to accept it and be okay with it. It's the part of you that when you learn about how someone who you've been having problems with, how their father yelled at them when they were a child or what they're going through at home, how they were conditioned. There, nothing about them has changed. And yet, because you understand the reason, the conditionality, the truth, something in your heart is big enough to say, oh, it's okay. It's like this. It's the letting go of the shoulds. And like I, I like the saying, expectations are just pre-planned resentments. So equanimity honors that level of truth, of conditionality, of the heart's capacity to hold all that imperfection and be okay with it because it points to that part of the heart 
which is transcendent of all this, which can acknowledge all those flaws and hold it in peace. And this is essential. The fact that there is something beyond these shifting conditions. In a sense, the world is falling apart in its eagerness to reveal what lies underneath. And the veil is constantly tearing, but only so that we can see the face behind that veil. And this conditioned realm is constantly revealing its imperfections to us. But you can look at it as doing that so that we will not become complacent and ignore the fact that there's something beyond those imperfections that is perfect and that we can move towards. And if we take refuge in that in the heart, if we take refuge in that path, then we can hold all these conditions in the world, not with a sense of feeding and clinging and tainting our love and the other three faces of the Brahma, of the Brahma Viharas with our own desires and agendas, but rather we can hold it lightly, nimbly with a sense of giving and blessing because our heart has another place to step back, to rest, to remember. And that is equipoise, that is equanimity. And there's a reason why on every list it is the final, or so many lists, it's the final and most refined of the qualities. But there's a place for it too. And it's not cold, and it's not filled with meh. It is warm like that light. And it illuminates both the path that we have to travel and the path where we've come and our own flaws and those flaws of those around us. It's the wider picture. So. That's enough. Chant uh, invitation to appreciation and we can chant sadhu together. Um, Dhammayang Dhammakata Sadhu Karanda Dhamma Se Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu